Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So a lot of times, a sermon has the intent of somehow having us do something or be challenged to be something that we hadn't thought of or desired. Believing that somehow in a message a preacher can convey or convict in such a way that life takes a different path, in a different direction. Tonight my desire is simply to talk about Jesus. Because you see, I, I happen to think that Jesus is particularly <coughs> difficult to get a handle on and quite challenging when we listen to what he says. Blessed are the poor. I don't think so. I mean, because I went to college to get an education so that I could get a good job, so that I could make money, so that I could have stuff and live in a comfortable home and drive a reliable car. Blessed are you who are hungry. I prefer to be full, <laughs> make it a Big Mac, or better, a Double Double. <laughs> Let me dine at Taylor's Hot Dogs until I can't squeeze another dog into my mouth. Let me feast at the Vintage Press until my credit card hits its limit. <laughs> Blessed are you who weep now. I would rather not. Is there any chance that I could weep later? Because right now I'm pretty focused on forgetting all of the challenges of life. Let me turn on the TV or... Netflix a movie or dial up the internet. Just go to bed early. Leap for joy at being laughed at, ridiculed, shunned because of my faith. You're asking a lot, Jesus. I think I understand why church membership and attendance is declining in the United States might have something to do with Jesus. It's not that what he did was so remarkable, and it was remarkable. It may be more what he said that's the hard part. I think maybe Jesus was his own worst enemy when it comes to public relations. He seems to go out of his way to show us just how different he is from us. For instance, Jesus challenges our value of family. We love our families. Oh, they might be a little messed up from time to time, but, but still they form our identity and they are our foundation. But Jesus said, whoever does not hate father and mother, spouse and children, can't be my disciples. Yikes. For instance, Jesus seems to be at, odd, at, at odds with the way that we love flag and country. And we have a lot of things that need to be attended to in our country, but we love America. We love our country. We believe it's the best in the world. But Jesus said we need to be clear that God and country don't necessarily go together. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he said and to God the things that are God's. Hmm. And for instance, we like our things. We have many things. We have sometimes so many things we need extra bedrooms to put our things, or our garages are full of things, or we put things that we only need on occasion in the attic, and we have storage units to put things that we don't need very often. But Jesus said, at least to one guy who had a lot of things go. Sell your possessions and give the money to the poor. Well, now you're meddling, Jesus. Sometimes I hear people say things like, I love Jesus. And I can't help but wonder, what do you mean by that? Do you really love Jesus? I mean, he's so different from you, your life doesn't look anything like his life. I could go on. 
it feels natural to us to, um, to distance ourselves from people who we don't like. We call them our enemies, but Jesus said we, we need to get close to them. We feel like it's natural to, uh, to get back at those who hurt us, an eye for an eye. But Jesus said we have to forgive them. We might find it natural to distance ourselves from those who are undesirable, those who are high maintenance, those we don't wish to be around. But Jesus said we have to love those people. Maybe it's time we stop the charade and simply say that what Jesus stands for is unnatural. Jesus is really not like us at all. In fact, Jesus might be working against us. Jesus maybe isn't our friend. Maybe Jesus is our enemy. Now, I know those are strong words, but I, I can't help but wonder how we're supposed to take Jesus. Because after all, as we read the Gospels, we discover that the people who hung around Jesus had a difficult time with him as well. It seems that whenever Jesus showed up on the scene, whether it's a house or the lake shore or the market or the temple, he sort of causes a dis-ease among people who are already there. You don't read stories about Jesus going around and slapping people on the back. You don't read stories about Jesus just kind of mixing with the crowd. You don't read stories about him just mingling with others. Jesus always seems to be different from everyone else. He doesn't blend in. He, he goes to a wedding and he changes the drink order. He goes to a dinner of a prominent citizen and a woman with um, a questionable background comes in and falls at his feet and weeps. He goes to a house full of people and somebody cuts a hole in the ceiling just to get to him. And, and then there are his stories. They're not the stories of a storyteller gathered around a campfire. No, his stories seem to make people upset. There once was a rich guy who died and went to Hades, and a poor guy who died and went to heaven. Which one are you? There once was a father with two sons, one who stayed home and complained, and the other who went off and made a mess of his life. Which one are you? Oh, and if you happen to work in the church, you might want to be very careful here. There once was a guy who got beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road, and two professional church workers walked right on by. But a good-for-nothing foreigners stopped and gave everything to help the person. Which one are you? Do you see? He doesn't make it easy on himself. And if the uncomfortable situations and the uncomfortable stories aren't enough, well then the things that Jesus does just makes you shudder. Defend a woman caught in the very act of adultery? Jesus, what are you thinking? Touch a sick person? Touch a leper? I wouldn't do that if I were you, Jesus. Tear down the money changer tables in the temple? I don't like them any more than you do, Jesus, but I think maybe you're going to cross a line here. I grew up singing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I'm beginning to wonder if I should be able to sing that song well. Not wishing to cast dispersions of people's personal piety, but when people talk about having a personal relationship with Christ, from them I get this impression that they have a relationship with Jesus, just like they have a relationship with their best buddy, 
or someone that they catch up on with over a cup of coffee, or maybe a colleague that they grab lunch with together. And I can't help but wonder, is that what Jesus had in mind when he said to, to us that if we wanted to be his disciples, we needed to deny ourselves and pick up our crosses and follow him? I mean, not, not walk side by side with him like you would your friend. No. To follow him. Carrying your cross. So I say again, Jesus is different from me. Different from us. He seems to value things that I, that we don't necessarily value. He seems to constantly be on the exact reverse end of the things that we find most important. He seems to value those things that for us are things that we would stay away from. So he's not like us. Maybe he's against us. And maybe you know he needs to be. I mean, just exactly what is the point of it all, of life? What in the world are we doing in this world? Do you ever have those moments when you despair? When you hear about some tragedy? When you hear about some injustice? When you hear about some stupid thing some global leader or national leader does, do you think to yourself, What's going on here? We're crazy. We hear stories about how the, the poor are pushed to the margins of the society, and yet we are the richest country in the world, and yet one out of six in the United States live below the poverty line. Poverty is not $24,300 a year for a family of four. That's just a number. Poverty is the constant stress of not knowing if you're going to have enough to eat, not knowing where you're going to sleep tonight, not knowing what emergency is going to hit you in the face and leave you on the streets. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, maybe he's simply saying that you'd better understand there's a whole segment of society that is on the edge and they are deeply important to God and Jesus is just wondering, do we care about them too? We hear stories about world hunger, and how today in the world there are 815 million people who are malnourished. And here's the thing. There's enough food produced in the world to feed everyone on the planet. But the number one reason for food scarcity is conflict. Nearly a, a half a billion people are hungry because they happen to live in a country who are at war. So when Jesus says, blessed are the hungry Maybe he is simply saying that those who live impacted by the decisions of a privileged few, those who are big and powerful people, we had better not forget that there are hungry people who are deeply valuable to our God. And don't you wonder, is this the best we can do? For all our advancements, for all of our education, is this the best we can do in creating our world. And then we might begin to take a good, hard look at our own lives and begin to realize that it's not just the world that is messed up, our own lives can be easily and deeply messed up as well. I mean, we have more stuff, more options, more technology, more of everything, and yet we don't feel good about ourselves. We want more and more, yearning to live at a higher level, wishing to have greater financial independence, and truth be known, wanting lavish lifestyles, but we know deep down, enough is never enough. And we look at our relationships, and we begin to see that how very rare unconditional love is, even within families, we hear stories of marriages that are on the rocks, and we experience conflict between neighbors, and we understand that our world is a place in which the, fit, the fittest will survive, and that the competition of the job levels or the schoolyards challenge our idea of whether or not we can truly be ourselves, because maybe if we are ourselves, others will see us as vulnerable, and will discover that we're not good enough to make a cut. 
And then, of course, that leads to a social pecking order, which somehow diminishes those who don't fit in, or pushes to the margin those who struggle or who find themselves simply unacceptable. And whether it's on the playground, or the playing field, or the classroom, or the workplace, or the neighborhood, personal worth and value are fragile. As fragile as thin sheets of glass so easily shattered. And it's from either the wide picture of an off-center world stage, or the existential struggle of human joy and worth that we begin to understand why Jesus is so different. He is at war with the values that we have come to inhabit. And he wishes somehow that his values would become ours. Maybe Jesus is not so much our enemy as he is, the enemy of everything that destroys and dehumanizes and devalues and demeans anybody. Jesus stands against oppression and systems and opinions and judgments, the powers that tear down what God has first said was good. And any time we think, act, or exist in the sweat under the sway of such powers, we can expect that we will be opposed to Jesus as well. I've often been led to believe that Ash Wednesday is all about asking God to forgive us for our mistakes, and in part, it is. But the bigger picture is that on Ash Wednesday, we're brought to the awareness how vastly different the ways of Jesus are from our own ways. And we have a choice today. We can either dismiss him as out of step with reality, or we can claim him as the savior of our broken world and our broken lives, the savior of a better reality. As with most things, the choice is up to us. Amen. We sing together the hymn, The Wonderful Cross, Please Rise. Thank mm -hmm. you.